today we are so fortunate to welcome another very special guest. We're talking today with Shannon Hahn. Shannon's going to talk to us today about life insurance. Life insurance can be very confusing. Do I need it? When do I need it? How much do I need? Who should hold it? How is it held? Who's the beneficiary? And to answer all those questions and more, we're talking to Shannon Hahn, who is a life insurance expert. Now, Shannon specializes in very complex solutions to situations, which is very near and dear to our heart because us at Anderson and Bobak, when we're dealing with the client as a complex family situation and we need to come up with a solution, we can count on Shannon and she can creatively help us with life insurance or long-term care insurance or disability insurance. Shannon commits herself to a continual policy review, so she will always make sure what's in place today is still good next year and next week. And she also will review policies for others who need her assistance. She's definitely a lifelong resource, and insurance education is her expertise. Shannon, welcome to Talk Tuesday. <laughs> Thank you, Anderson and Bobek. I am so delighted to be here. And we are delighted to have you. So let's just kick it off. What the heck? Life insurance, does everybody need it? You know, you love someone, owe someone, or want to leave a legacy. And life insurance and disability insurance can provide that financial security. And you do, regardless of whether you have a policy, you want to think about your future and your long-term plan. Shannon, what is a, a time that somebody can't get insurance, life insurance? Is it because they're too old or their um, medical history doesn't provide for it? Is there situations where people are not allowed to get it even though they want it? Yes, there is a consideration where you can be classified as uninsurable. But we all, you know, depending on the type of person you are, you may be harder on yourself than you deserve to be. <laughs> Um, there, we do specialize and what we do and we make sure we collect medical records at times. So we, if you really think you're uninsurable, there's a few knockout questions that I can ask and would know. Yes, maybe not now. And as you get older, there would be a, sometimes a, a not, not ever, but look at the advances in medical technology these days. Um, so even, you know, breast cancer years ago, it would be a, at least a 10 year delay. That's not the case anymore. Um, treatments are so much more advanced. Our quality of living and medical technology is better and we're all living longer. So just as you think of there's impairments, there's also the ways we live our life and our hobbies and our good health and good eating and um, all of that factors in. So at times the quick answer is yes, you can be an insurable, but don't make that determination yourself. Enlist in an advisor to help you work through that process. And one tip um, is you would never, if you are concerned about your insurability, you would never want to sign a formal application. So you'd never want to sign up online and say, I'm going to just apply to see if I qualify. You want to stay under the radar. So that's why we collect medical records and do things in a way that would never affect your insurance record. Um, there is an insurance sharing database among insurance companies called, called the Medical Information Bureau. So everyone has an MIB report. So if at one point you, oh. <laughs> I know, if at one point you applied for insurance and did not say you were a smoker, but you had you provided lab results and they saw nicotine nicotine would be on a marker so in wow. illinois these days that now that we're a cannabis state it's important to, there are companies that view that differently does not mean you're insurable we just need to know you know if it's uh, it's medical usage if not how often and the more again it's the more you know the more we know up front the better we can build a solution for you so if there's some problem I have, let's say I'm like really big, fat, um, obese, and they're like going to insure me, do they insure me for more because of my medical condition? Like I'm not uninsurable, I'm no. insurable, but do I have to pay more because my health is bad? Yes, correct. 
you do have to, you would pay a higher premium. At times you would be considered rated. They would add some ratings, which goes to the financial cost of it. But let's say you do lose 20 pounds in the and really now that you mention it. <laughs> I know. Let's get that COVID, <laughs> COVID weight off, right? Um, as long as you kept weight off or have, you know, stopped a medication, there's a lot tied to weight, as we know. So let's say you really get on that straight and narrow, um, you know, and and keep weight off or are don't smoke anymore. Um, it, smoking at least three years, we can take a look back. And sometimes we just go back to the company you already have and say, here's the records, here's the lab results, and I've improved my situation. Can I get a better rating now? And at times we'll, we'll get the smoker classification removed. So it, it, it is important as, as Janice said, to stay in touch and know that you've got someone looking and reviewing and earmarking down the road. Hey, are you still on these medications? Are you still, you know, conditions don't typically disappear, but the longer you live with the condition and it stays level, the better off you are. And so at times we can, and we do improve um, ratings for our clients. You know, I'm interested, to, I, I wanna follow up on this MIB report. I didn't know I had one, apparently I do. So is this, is this something that I can take a look at? Like my credit report, is it as important as a credit report? No, it's not as important as a credit report. If all you have is group life insurance, you would not have an MIB report. So if you're just getting coverage through your employer, you would not have an MIB. It's when you are signing a formal application with a, a company. I'm an independent broker, so I have multiple companies. Um, so it, it, when you're signing an application, they will be reviewing your record. Um, and adding to your record. It's an, ins it's an insurance data exchange. How far back do they go? We have a question online. How far back in your medical records do they look? The, well, medical records is different from MIB. So the MIB, um, they will look seven, seven years back. So things will fall off at that time. Whereas on your medical records, depending on the condition, so I do have some older clients. So sometimes we go back past five years on medical records to 10 years. It's all about the conditions that are listed in your current medical records. And so we do, um, you do as a, um, a consumer want to know what's in your medical records um, from your physicians and just know that, um, you know, at times there's different views on who you think you are versus your physician. And just making sure you're on the same page with your doctor is always important. At times, there are discrepancies. There's a lot of data with Obamacare. There was a lot of um, moving records to electronic formats. So it's not often, but at times there is an error in your records. And we've also helped clients work with their physicians to have those fixed as well. Jessica, what do you think about um, naming your child as a beneficiary on, on the life insurance? On the life insurance policy? Well, I think that that's a terrible idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that the, you know, in our area, Shannon, when we deal with life insurance policies, there's always a back and, well, almost always a back and forth about who the beneficiary is going to be. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people want to name their minor children um, and I don't know if you've had any experience with that, but typically that means we're opening an estate if something happens to a parent. So a lot of times we're telling people name, um, somebody is like the trustee for the benefit of your kids. Mm -hmm. So do you advise people that way ever? And do you send them to an estate attorney? Do you have like, yes, checklist? yes, we, that is part of our checklist. So what's important to know is, is beneficiary also owner of the policy. The owner of the policy typically has the control. That can be different than the person who pays the policy. So, and then that all trickles down. So at times I have clients that'll bring me coverages they already have, and they will have listed their minor child. And we stop right then and there and say this, the problem is the beauty of life insurance. It's a contract and it stays out of the probate state. So not to get too technical, but basically when a death claim is, is, is submitted, 
and paid, it goes directly. There is no stopping at the court. There's no judge. There's no anyone. It goes to your beneficiary. If it's a minor child, the problem is then it goes to probate. Then someone else who is of age has to help manage that money. And the worst thing in the world would be for you to think you've got this money going to your beneficiary and your child, and it, it, it's not, it's going to take time and extra money to have it get there. So um, we, we talk about that often. And, and I even, I do not manage any sort of money, but I always verify on the retirement accounts as well, making sure that your minor children are, are not and so minor in the state of Illinois is 18 years. It's different per state. So that's also important to know where you live. Um, the, the age of majority could be different. But in the end, the beauty of life insurance is it's a check that will be paid once that death claim is in good order, in cash, no other taxes, nothing else, directly to your beneficiary. And you want to make sure that's one of the fastest things um, that that can get to your, your loved ones um, when they need it. And we do. Yeah. We, we always have the life insurance in our agreements when there's children. The problem is, I swear to God, there's so many fights over who's the beneficiary and the other spouse who you're divorcing always wants to be that beneficiary, you know, and there's the fight. Nobody wants the spot, the ex spouse, right, to be the beneficiary. Um, so we try to appoint like a brother or, but. We fight more, at least I do, we fight more about that beneficiary than anybody. I, I and I see that all the time. Um, and and I will say, it's, it's the fight of the beneficiary, but I think the one that gets overlooked is the owner, making sure, you know, if you're the owner, you have the right to change that beneficiary at any time. So keeping that in mind, ownership is the control, whether it's your life insurance policy, your disability policy, your long-term care policy. If, if you're in a marriage and each of you has bought a long-term care policy, that ownership is really important because how the benefit is paid will be paid in accordance to the, the ownership as well. Um, so that's on, on a living benefit on the long-term care side and the disability side. But on the life insurance side, to your point, the beneficiary is the, the one who is, is will receive the benefit. And that's where trusts, you know, to just- Who's the owner? Hmm? Who, who's the owner then? Is it the person who is life is insured or is it the beneficiary? It doesn't have to be. So I, in a situation where, um, where the, um, let, let's say I, I've had situations in the past where um, the spouse, she, she had been abused, so she was making sure that her husband didn't have any ownership of the policy. She was going to be the owner to have the control. Now, he was the payer. That, that's a problem there because if he's not going to pay, we've got other situations. So, um, but ownership always allowed her to keep control of who the beneficiary was. She wanted it to be her child. That was in, the, in an agreement in the divorce uh, uh, decree that actually it was the mother the, the grandma who was custodian. And so that's until age of, they, they had determined a different age, um, but age of majority. And then they replaced it down the line with a trust where the trust had ultimate control and trustee had control because they didn't want the son to have the benefit until he was 25. So it, 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 if, if you're willing to have state law dictate the age of majority, then you can have a custodian. Um, someone you you trust, but I can see Kim's point where that's a fight can definitely be a fight, and um, and then if if you want more control over the money and how it's to be used, that's when a trust would would get involved, and you'd have a trustee then that is the um, the the one who has has the ability to make that discretionary changes. Yeah. Jeanette does have a follow-up question, if that's okay. Sure. Yes, uh, she wants course. to know if there's a limit to how many life insurance policies a person can have. That's a good question. No, there is not a limit. There, there's a limit to the death benefit size in total. So whenever we are um, 
going through underwriting, there's not only medical underwriting about you as your person, there's also financial underwriting. So um, when, when you're applying for life insurance, they're gonna ask you what policies you currently have. And we're gonna say who they're with and the death benefit amounts. And also if we're replacing any of those. Um, if not, then we need to make sure that income and salary um, qualifies financially for the death benefit amount. So um, they will not let, you know, let's say you're only making, you know, 75,000 a year, they may not, the insurance company may say, well, why are you applying for a $10 million death benefit for the next 10 years? <laughs> Even if it's just for a short time, they're financially at times we need to qualify. And so where that comes into place is at times um, business owners and young entrepreneurs, it, 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 even when we're you know, going through divorce, um, at times we need to have evaluation so we know that um, we're not overshooting financially what the valuation is of that company in order to provide that, that death benefit. So there is financial underwriting that we guide our th clients through as well. And I know I'm hogging all the questions here, but I have one more and then I'll shut up. <laughs> Fine. I know it's I'm fun. I'm really curious if you can, like, if you've got a spouse or ex spouse, can you insure them kind of without their knowledge and pay the policy? You know what I mean? Like, you, you want to have, make sure that you're really, your child is provided for, or you're provided for. Um, no. Can you put out a policy on somebody else? No, no, actually, um, no, you can, you cannot do that. Actually, that did come up a few years ago. It's called stranger owned life insurance. <laughs> um, no, you have to have an insurable interest in order to purchase a life insurance policy on someone else. And, and so making sure that we um, line things up appropriately is, is important. And as an ins if you're insuring someone's life, they will have to sign as the applicant because it's their life that's being insured. So, but good question. Good question. That's called, that's called, that's called, that's called dateline. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, what do you, mean, like, should, you know, <laughs> in that same tone and not to be too morbid. Yeah. I didn't mean like Brad Pitt or somebody. I meant no, like, like no. my ex-husband or, you know what I mean? Right. Like I meant somebody that I'm. Right. Dateline. You know, <laughs> well, and I and, and to that point, if there is um, if there is a question upon death of um, it, it, how, cause of death, those types of things, a, a, a death certificate has to go with the death claim. So, if you can't get a death certificate, if there's still questions, if there's an investigation, if the beneficiary, so this happened to. Um, to, in, to, in a divorce case, they were not officially divorced and the um, insured pa an owner passed away. He had updated his beneficiary to be his fiance, but you know, the soon-to-be ex-spouse was going after the death benefit and yet he had a, his group life death benefit that was going to her to his ex soon to be ex spouse. So in the end, it had to be litigated. Um, and, and so the insurance company, if there's any question of beneficiary. And if, if a if, if there's a contesting party out there, they will not pay the death benefit until they know 100% they're paying the right party because they don't want to pay twice, number one. <laughs> But um, they, they will make sure that they are fo following the letter of the law. And where that comes around at times, you've got to look at the contract, look at the paperwork. Anytime there's a change of beneficiary, of owner, that's why there's still a form. It's, there's always a form involved. It can't just be an email. Um, so see, all parties are, or the appropriate parties are typically signing up a, a a change form when any of those changes are being made. Right, but in your instance where he gave it to the fiance, I mean, she's not ever going to be able to get his death certificate, right? Because the wife would. So how could she well, ever? So they went to court. They went to court. Oh, you have to sue them. Okay. Yeah. You, you know, and, and, 
And we have questions a lot. I mean, we have clients who say, well, I, I'm going to change my beneficiaries on my life insurance right away while they're going through a dissolution of marriage. Now, we always advise against that because of the same thing that you're talking about. It's going to potentially end up in more litigation if you don't have approval of that first. Um, so, so, so we know that's an issue and beneficiary naming is very important. The other thing I want to be sure that we talk about is a lot of times we use life insurance, not only protect child support so that if the, the, the um, one of the parents die, there's money to provide for the kids. But what about maintenance? When you're getting a maintenance award, is it a good idea to have a life insurance policy to protect the maintenance or is there other ways around that? That can be one of the ways for sure. There's also disability. Um, so uh, because I deal in complex solutions, we can actually look at a cash flow. So the maintenance flow and the child support flow and say, this is how much that lump sum should be. And we can solve for a death benefit. That death benefit can even, we can model it to go up or down through the years. So that's one thing we can do on the life insurance side, but on the disability side, if it's so contentious that you don't ever want to be going back to your, your ex-spouse, you could have a special divorce disability policy built with those potentially decreasing um, maintenance and child support through the years. And as child support would go down, then, then the, the disability could go down. So we can build customized plans um, that really provide ex extra um, emotional and financial security. Isn't it really expensive to have disability? I mean, most people who are gonna to have to pay for this will say, I'll provide a life insurance policy because yes. I'm assuming a term policy is relatively inexpensive. But how do you convince somebody that disability is the appropriate solution sure. and who pays for that? Sure. Well, disability is, to your point, Janice, it's, it's you know, if you're comparing it to term, it's multiples, four to five times more expensive premium wise. Um, and, and yet, depending on the, the, the couple and the finances involved, um, it, it can really provide a lot of security that, you know, I, I've said it and I, I don't ever have to, to worry about it. Um, but to your point, it has to be the right client, um, it has to be able to afford it. Also where disability can become important and individual disability is something you should have is if, if it's a person who is paid, um, large bonuses, but a lower salary. A lot of traditional disability policies, group disability, are only gonna pay on that salary to a cap. And you're, you're more likely to become disabled. You know, four to five times more likely to become disabled. And, and it's the car accident, it's the stroke, it's the mental health. There, this world, and I think we're all, especially in this COVID environment, seeing you know our how our stressors affect our our physical being. But um, I I work with entrepreneurs, and and the thought is, unless it's my brain, you know, I I will make it happen. But um, if you, if you now have a physical disability because of the ski accident you know, there, it's just going to affect you in, in different ways. And um, so disability, it, it, it's definitely a harder sale, but it can, it can really um, provide a lot of peace of mind on both sides. I don't have to ever deal with this. We built a program for it and I'm going to pay. So it's, it's just whatever happens to me. And the thing about disability is the sooner you buy it, the younger you are. Um, it's typically uh, guaranteed and non-renewable, so the insurance company can't change the rates on you. Um, we can also lock in that guarantee for five years, and you can then see um, how it changes. So there, there's ways to um, mitigate some of the, the, the cost when you're building a customized plan as well. Are they term policies similar to life insurance for disability, or are they just like once you lock it in, you can keep it as long as you want? 
once you lock it in and pay the premium, you can keep it as long as you want. Disability is a little, and, and term, term, it's called term because you just have a duration that you're insuring. And, and every year with disability or term life insurance, um, you have that option to pay the premium. If you don't pay the premium, the coverage would, would lapse after typically two, 60 days. Um, so it, it's a, every year you're electing whether you want the coverage. And again, to my point, you change jobs, change incomes, um, or you, so financially your life changes. You can decide whether, you, you know, if, if that premium, um, you know, should change. And, and if you're concerned about support payments changing and, and all of that, disability can really um, provide a peace of mind that it's, it's always going to be there regardless of, of what happens to my ex-spouse. But you're not the beneficiary, right, of a disability policy. Who gets the money? If, I'm, I, if I get divorced and my spouse has a disability policy to, to protect my maintenance payment, how does that protect my maintenance payment if it, he gets a disability check every month? Actually, these are special policies that are specifically designed for, designed for the divorce decree. So you do you do get the payment. It's that is awesome. That's great to know. That's great to know. <laughs> yeah. Um, be yeah, because I was unaware that there was a specific divorce disability policy. So that's really critical when we're talking about protecting maintenance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and at times these are Lloyd's of London, but it, it, there are definitely ways, and even in the short term, if, if coverage hasn't been secured, there are short-term coverages that we can put in place for up to a year to make sure that we're covering our bases. So while, you know, at, at times um, there's changes that not only is a divorce, there's, there's employment changes, there, there's a lot changing at that time. So. Um, we've, we at times have short term solutions we can, we can put in place that again, provide peace of mind. But there, no, there are disability policies that go along with the divorce decree. What about for child support? Is there special child support policies for? Well, I, it, it's actually all under the same umbrella. So, um, so it, it's again, that cash flow. how we build the policy is looking at what, whether it's maintenance and child support, if that's starting off here and then maybe dropping down, you, you build it with the, the potential outlays uh, that, that are being hashed out through the divorce. What's the craziest thing you've ever seen get insured? <laughs> yeah, in, well, <laughs> that, that's it, get insured. Um, <laughs> My you know, <laughs> not, right. not, the crazy, not the craziest person, just the craziest <laughs> thing. Well, um, you know, we we do see, I mean, we see entertainers, executives. Um, so I, I, I don't see as much craziness. I'm always happy when I can get someone coverage when I can. <laughs> so that's where I've seen some of the, the crazy things. Um, but, you know, a lot has changed recently with cannabis law with um, what's going on. One of the, the, the thing that for in general, when you're going through a divorce, I think is the making sure you understand what you currently have in the insurance arena with, um, with living benefits, making sure, seeing if there's anything uh, that you that where you are either an insured, um, making sure you know and think of that when you go to Anderson and Bobeck and say, I, I've got all these things, make sure you think of where, where did I apply for something? Um, because you see those statements because you're not the owner. So thinking about those, those things. Well, Jeanette has yet another question. I think she should join the show and come onto the panel. Sure. <laughs> All right, here she goes. Um, if you have a policy on your spouse and you are paying for the policy, your spouse signed the application, so we're good there. Does your spouse have the right to cancel the policy at any time? And she also wants to know if she can insure her pet. 
<laughs> See, I knew Jan that was coming in here sometime. I just knew it. <laughs> well, the answer is absolutely. Everyone should insure their pet. <laughs> life insure, life insurance, a uh, health insurance, leash insurance. Yeah, oh, seriously. Trainer insurance. Yeah, it's all critical. Well, if you were to die, you would want somebody to take care of your pet. Let's say it's an expensive pet, you know, like a horse or, right. you know, it's Isn't expensive. Be, Horses are expensive. Wouldn't that be on your life? Because the pet. Yeah, that you would you would leave a pot. You would leave money for your pet. You wouldn't be insuring your pet's life for you right. to get money when your pet dies. Well, right. right, but that's what I meant. Like, if you were to die, you would want to make sure that whoever has enough money to care for your pet. Right. Well, well and the parrots, by the way, because they live so long. Don't they live like 80 years or something? Yes. And koi. Koi, yeah. too. Koi, too. <laughs> what a surprise. Oh, you get a call from somebody that says, oh, you're the beneficiary of a life insurance. And here's the parrot. And here's the $50,000 <laughs> to take that's care That's true. Of. Well, no Jessica, way. Jessica could write the trust to make sure that the parrot has everything. Well, isn't that the case with... Um, Oh, I can see him, uh, a famous designer that passed away. His cat is getting most of his, his estate. But anyway, nice. backing up, as, as long as you are the owner of the policy, you, the insured cannot cancel it and you pay it, you, it, you, um, the policy will continue. So when she says if she has a policy on her spouse, then she's the owner of the policy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he signs, so he's authorizing. Yeah. And then um, as long as she pays it, he can't do yep. anything about it. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yep. So. There's, a, there's, another, there's another question here that is a real simple answer. It says, if you lose your job, which provided your life insurance and your marital settlement agreement required you to provide that life insurance and, and you don't have it anymore because you lost your job, you've got to either number one, go get another policy that's comparable, or number two, do a motion to modify that MSA. Because once you lose your job and you don't have that policy that you're required to keep, you're in violation of the MSA. So there's mm -hmm. a solution, but you have to act. Correct. Correct. But it's usually not that much money. So I can't imagine by the time, I mean, really, truly, if you think about it, by the time you file a motion or hire an attorney to file a motion and you go to court and you have a hearing, you know, the money that you spent on all of that, you just mm -hmm. would be better off getting another policy. I mean, they're only eight or nine hundred dollars under a thousand most of the time. Well, I guess it depends. It depends it on what you're insuring. It depends on how healthy you are. It depends on your right. age. It depends on all kinds of things, how much they are. And it depends. Is it term policy or right. is it something else? I don't even, Shannon, I, I know there's a whole slew of other things out there. Well, and one thing to think about, if it is a cash value life insurance policy that is purchased while you're in the marriage. So cash value life insurance could be whole life universal life, variable universal life, that has a cash value component inside of the policy. So inside of the policy, there's cash, and then there's a death benefit. So that's also an asset to think of and take inventory of when you are going through a divorce. And so at times, if you, if you don't want to affect the policy performance, that's, a, again, another point of negotiation in, in that, that um, with that asset, there's value to it, not just a death benefit. But to Kim's point, you know, age doesn't matter. You know, I had a client who, um, who we had, I wrote letters to a judge um, saying that we tried everything possible to get life insurance for her. And, um, and it's, it's a not now. So in, in five years, she'll have been sober. So that was a big deal in proving to the, because it, I don't think it was actually about the death benefit. We had a budget, everything. So it was about the ex-spouse forcing her to do that and go through what she thought was going to be, you know, some humiliation. And I said, you know what, we're going to try and here's how we're going to do it. It's not going to affect that MIB. We will keep it off the record. We'll collect the records and we'll see what we can do. And, um, you know, so we will revisit her situation in another 18 months now. And um, that, that's what we do because this is, it's, it's all about everyone's situation is different and family history at times can really affect you. 
um, and, and you don't know it until you go through an underwriting process. So it's, it's the more, it's the, again, the more we know and being with a person who asks the right questions when you start the process. There's a lot to a lot of know. Information. <laughs> how do people how do people reach you, Shannon, if they if they want to talk with you about their insurance needs or if there is a an, a divorce attorney out there who needs some creative solutions to a sure. complex situation? Sure. Um, I can be reached. I'm on LinkedIn and I can be reached at 312-415-6107. And I'm with Pillar International Insurance Advisors. Um, so I will put my information in the chat. Would that be appropriate as well? Um, sure. And everyone can have my information as well. That's great. Thanks for joining us today. There's so much to know about insurance and we really appreciate your knowledge, your expertise, and it was great chatting with you on this Talk Tuesday. Oh, I enjoyed it so much. Thank you and appreciate the opportunity. And again, it's about you love someone, owe someone, and want to leave a legacy and making sure you have the coverage that will help you do that. Okay, Great. love someone, owe someone, want to leave a legacy. Great <laughs> words. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you, you too, Bye. Shannon. Bye. Bye.